everybody, welcome to What The Trads. What, what The, the Trads! Yep, it's us, we are back. How are you two? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. I uh, I had a, uh, I recently have finally finished the entirety of uh, the Alan Wake game. <laughs> the first okay. one remastered. So that's been a point of personal pride recently. Uh, that game has a grip on me. It's not even that I love it, it's just I have a, an attachment to it now, I guess. Um, mm. So that's kind of what I've been doing recently. How about you, Alex? How was your holiday? Oh, it's been lovely. I came back from uh, the Game of Thrones land of Westeros, aka Croatia. Um, it was very lovely, not quite Game of Thronesy, but fortunately um, all that death, sex and all that was... I was going to say, that's that's probably a good thing. Was yeah. rather yeah. absent. Yeah. You want to try and keep the betrayal to a minimum when you're on holiday. <laughs> no, definitely. Though some fucker have poisoned me earlier, later on that um, bloody cruise. <laughs> because, like, on one of on the last day where we could go to a location like Montenegro, I just had the worst food poisoning at the end of it. But every single person I've spoken to always goes, oh, yeah, that's normal. You get terribly sick one point during the trip. And I'm like, but that's not fair. <laughs> But aside from that, lots of alcohol, uh, which is probably part of that sort of series. Um, maybe, 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 maybe just a tad. <laughs> it's like I'm a raging alcoholic, but um... <laughs> hey, your words. <laughs> yeah, we we said nothing. So uh, it's been a lovely uh, holiday, though. Now I've got planning my next one in Rome later on next month. But um... lovely. Yeah, so that's my holidaying fun. Uh, how about you, Ash? How have you been? I, all right, so I now have a, a, a CPAP machine. Ooh. Ah. Constant, constant positive airway pressure machine, and it's like a mask attached to a tube that I wear when I sleep because I have sleep apnea and, and quite badly um, to the extent I'd wake up after sleeping for not very long and obviously not feel very refreshed. So I've got this machine... And I've kind of got I've got a little obsessed with it because you can connect it to like an app on your phone and see, oh, well, I slept for seven hours and 54 minutes last night, which is better than the previous night when I slept for, for seven hours and 47 minutes. I'm kind of getting a little bit obsessed with the number and it kind of feels like that's maybe not the way to approach it. It's like try and sleep first and worry about the number second. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I had a weirdly similar thing happen when um, this is not really super relatable, but the gamification of sleep is I got Pokemon sleep because I am both an early bird and a night owl, which means, yes, I'm an insomniac. Um, so hmm. I figured, oh, a game where you get to feed a Snorlax and then you collect Pokemon when you sleep. That's great. I love that. Let me do that. At first, yes, I was just very excited to to get to sleep. This is a fun time, but after a while, <laughs> you start. I just started to get stressed about the Snorlax because if I had a bad night's sleep, my Snorlax would pay the price, and my my oh. Pokemon would pay the price. And then I just started to feel like I am a single parent not doing strong enough and well enough by my kids. <laughs> so I ended up um, uninstalling it when there there was there was a period where glitches kept happening, just kept happening. So like I I'd, I'd set it up. And it wouldn't record um, everything or I'd, I'd set it up right. And then in the morning it would be like, oh, due to a problem, we had to delete it. So after about a week, I was like, oh, I guess it just isn't going to work anymore. Um, and, I, <laughs> and I stopped. But it's weird how when the numbers get into your head, once you get like a sleep score or something, you start to get yes. so hyper focused on it. And you're like, ooh. I've got like a smartwatch, which uh, has the feature for sleep tracking. But I always take my watch off during the night. So it's like a cool feature that I'm just missing out on because of my uh, my habits. Oh, yeah. You're always counting the steps on those things, actually, aren't you? I remember when we were doing the reporting on Pride. Yeah. Oh, Trans Pride London, a good old 30,000 steps. Uh, not as <laughs> impressive today, but only 8,787, if ah. one wants to ask. Yeah, I used to have a um, step counter on my phone um, at various points when I was walking to work. Obviously, not doable anymore, but um, I got a little bit obsessed with the numbers. I think, I think that's kind of what we do as humans. Like, we kind of can get a bit obsessed with the minutia um, rather than the overarching, hey, you're getting a lot of steps in or, hey, you're, you're getting, your sleep's better now kind of thing. Mm. Anyway, 
Okay, away from the gamification. So before we get into the news properly, there's just something we want to pick up on from the last episode. We talked about psychogenic illnesses and the fact that a man named Simon Wesley has weaponized that term to try and imply that psychogenic illnesses are not real, are not worthy of respect or interaction or care. That is obviously not how we feel on it. Psychogenic illnesses are very real. Of course. But we were highlighting that a person who's been now appointed to a very high position within the Children and Young People's Gender Dysphoria Research Oversight Board has in the past worked with the DWP and defined and considered psychogenic illnesses to be people who are, you know, people who suffer from them are actually just malingerers, are actually yeah. just lazy. They're, you know, um, and that's not the case, obviously. That is absolutely not our interpretation of it at all. That is Simon Wesley's interpretation of it, and we condemn that in the strongest possible terms. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, if we didn't come across clear enough on that, then that is our bad. Uh, mm -hmm. Our apologies. It, it's an important thing to make sure that we're being clear. The last thing we would want to do is to end up putting out any kind of ableist sentiment when the very thing we were trying to do with that part was to have a conversation about um, tackling ableism and about the way mm -hmm. in which both of those parts of our identities intersect. And with that out of the way, Alex, we have some slightly more fun news, don't we? Yeah, exactly. We've got some really cool things coming up, and that thing is the What the Trans Awards. We recently just announced on our socials um, earlier this month that we are um, now doing an awards show on um, the end of the year. Mm-hmm. So we've got a, a whole swathe of different categories, um, which are, you know, you can suggest people, you can even suggest categories, um, people who should be um, awarded, should be noticed for their work, for their contributions. We've got Book of the Year, Queer Film of the Year, Activists. Of the Year, Journalists, the year. Lawyers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, ex mm -hmm. All sorts of things. So we're going to take a lot of suggestions and then we're going to collate those suggestions and put those out to a public vote to say, well, here's what's been voted on. And that, the, you know, the results of that voting process will be the awards show, which we will do in late December. Yeah. yeah. Something a little bit more fun. Indeed. The uh, nominations um, for will be closing on the 25th of November so that we can put together the voting form by the first. Mm, yeah, the yeah. Get, get your thoughts in. It'll be really cool to see what people want to put forward. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's a couple of pretty obvious ones <laughs> that are emerging so far and <laughs> fantastic, but we'll, we'll talk about those in December. But yeah, if you have any suggestions for the different categories, you can find those categories on our social media. Get involved, chip in, give us your two cents. Yeah, chuck it in. Uh, no corporate sponsors, none of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, for... Now with that, uh, that's the first bit. We've also got another thing we're introducing. And yes. It's a new segment called Action Alley. Da -da. Da -da. I'm sure we could find a, a, a sting for that. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> So, with all the shitty news you've seen, you can probably hear the majority of it in our US edition of our podcast. So, and we were like, things are going to get a lot harder, so we wanted to see what we could do to help coordinate people and give calls of action to show what you, dear listener, can do. Things from upcoming protests, letter writing campaigns, consultation guides and other actions and we're going to dub this segment Action Alley. If you have any events or campaigns that you want us to highlight, get in touch. We have a whole channel on our Discord where you can submit things alongside this. Feel free to email or message or get in touch with us on our social media and we can include them in this segment. In terms of what there is at the moment, there aren't really many protests coming up, but there are some uh, vigils for Trans Day of Remembrance coming up all over the country. So we're going to link to Trans Protest UK's Google Doc where they have listed all of them. Trans Protest UK is a fantastic resource for protests and other actions and all, all that sort of stuff. So check that if you can. There's also a fundraiser for the Outside Project and more specifically low 
they're going to be launching a new shelter for homeless trans folk to come to so if you've got some money donate to their fundraiser where they're getting supplies and all that good stuff to make sure that the folks out there can get the support they need so uh, we're going to link that in the description as well so check that out if you can another sort of action you can take earlier last week trans actual went to parliament with a bunch of trans folks to make sure as many mps in parliament got to meet a trans person to put a face to those they're trying to oppress and we're going to link that campaign in the description as that campaign is looking to be ongoing and it's going to get people to meet their mps but this time trans actual is wanting people to report back on which mps people have gone to and how it went and identifying which mps i've yet to meet trans constituents and supporting people in doing that as well and with that uh, earlier this week they spoke to a bunch of people in parliament and we spoke to Transactual about this and this is what they had to say. Hi, I'm Helen Belcher from Transactual and with me is... I'm Shay Brown and Pranante Him from Transactual. So we've just done a, um, a Meet Us, Hear Us event in parliament which was brilliantly attended. I've done a, an event in parliament before many years ago where I had 13 MPs come and one of the MPs said this is an absolutely outstanding turnout. Normally you get five to six, you know, and that's a good turnout. Uh, we had 27 people through the door uh, of all different parties. Lots of very good supported conversations. Lots of people asking how they can help. I think that it's, it's been an overwhelmingly positive and brilliant event. Yeah, and I, I think it's really good as well that, you know, the, the, the people from the community that were part of the drop-in event um, for MPs, come from lots of different backgrounds, different lived experiences, and, and some of the people that were there were not people that would normally be in meeting rooms with MPs, so that so actually the MPs and members of the Lords that came along were able to hear different perspectives and not from sort of people who's, you know, it's mine and Helen's job to have these conversations, mm. um, but, but, pe but people just talking about their own experiences, you know. Um, it was lovely as well. We had um, some people had individual one-to-one -one meetings with their MPs, um, and, and, and that's something that we're encouraging people to do. And, and sort of have patience if you've written to your MP. The, the especially the new ones have got a lot of still setting up their offices, and it, it, people don't have to have taken part today to be part of the meetings here. This campaign it is over over the next few years. It's, it's about getting MPs hearing what we've got to say and about the reality of our lives and just cutting through all the nonsense in the press and all the mis misinformation they've heard. And I think the, the important thing there that Jay said was that there were other one-on-one -on -one meetings going on um, which weren't counted in the 27. So I know of at least two MPs who had meetings with constituents who didn't come through the door, so weren't counted in those 27. So yeah, keep going. Um, there are a lot of people who are worried about what's happening to trans people in the UK, but don't quite know what to do about it. So they need to hear our voices, our experiences to help them uh, formulate their thoughts and get, get the wording right and, and get some ideas flowing. Did, was puberty blockers discussed at any point at all? Yes, it was. Some people were specifically concerned about puberty blockers and CAST, the CAST review and the potential overreach that CAST has had in terms of uh, education policy or charity commission recommendations. I think more people were worried about general health care and how CAST fitted into that overall uh, mix. We were able to, well, I, I certainly was able to introduce uh, our report from last month where we had a couple of hundred adults saying that their GPs had withdrawn from shared care agreements or refusing to prescribe and explaining the impact that that would have on trans people and people were very uh, interested and concerned about that and wanting to move that one forwards. A lot of these things are moved forwards not in terms of public questions but in terms of behind the scenes discussions. So I, I, whilst I, there have been a number of those going on, I think there will be more of those going on. And the information that we've provided, the background that we've provided, 
and the real life experiences that people in the room were able to give, I think moves those conversation, enables those conversations to move on in a much better way. Yeah, and so for example, in just one conversation, there was two of us talking to uh, a, a member of the House of Lords and saying, yep, yeah, we've both had the experience of relocating and having a GP um, hum and ha about our hormone prescription and, and not, the, not the other prescriptions that, that we've had. So it's, it's you know, straight away, so bringing, bringing our lived experiences into in, in making us more than just statistics are all well and good and useful. So people, please, please do use our reporting tool if you refused um, a, a GP a, a prescription by your GP, mm-hmm. but also putting a human face on it. And this is it shouldn't be where we're at, but where we're at at the moment is, is sort of reminding people that we're human beings, and we're not we're not a we're not a hypothetical debate. Mm. We're not yeah. you know scary horrible people. We're just human beings like anyone else. And I think a lot of it is also people are very aware of how divisive trans issues, trans people in our lives, have become with very polarised views. So it was, a, it was interesting to be able to say to a couple of MPs, well, OK, you want to find a middle way. Well, the middle way between me living as Helen all the time and me not being allowed to live as Helen is what? That maybe I should only do it before lunchtimes or Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. I mean, what what is that middle way? And that and that point got across very very strongly, um, and it was able then to point to things like the Trump election campaign, pouring so much money into anti-trans ads and how Trump had relied really on disinformation and tying what we're experiencing. We're not the only people. The, not the only community experiencing this. Other communities like um, immigrants, Muslims, uh, Gypsy Roma traveller, community disabled people increasingly as well, all experiencing this othering and this disinformation campaign and how what its fundamental purpose is is to destroy trust in democracy and the systems that hold it to account and if we value our society if we value our democracy then that is worth fighting for and it's worth seeing what's happening to trans people in that bigger picture and a lot of mps understood that very easily see that was a fantastic interview yeah definitely nice great interview people do need to get involved in this yeah really yeah definitely we're trying to transactual on ourselves to try and stress that it's different from the usual try and meet your MP campaign although that is part of it hearing that this one is something rather productive compared to some other campaigns and from what we're told reporting back to transactual is going to have an impact as well because they'll be able to coordinate oh okay this constituency this constituency and this one haven't responded at all how can we try and get them on side how can we get a trans person in front of that MP to share their story. So it's uh, it's all a bit strategic. And it's um, this kind of thing, I think, is going to be really helpful for us getting a better understanding of just how... I think it could be a really good litmus test for where mm. some people in Parliament are at regarding respecting our rights and protecting them. The more that we know about that, the more that we know about people who are positive negative towards that whatever it gives us that knowledge gives us more ability to know how we're going to handle it and respond to it and and push further for our rights all exciting stuff yes well and i i hope that campaign goes well i hope it sort of continues but now we've got to do our thing those classic what the trans hijinks that you've come to know and tolerate so yeah let's let's do the news no not the news So to start with, just quickly, there has been another extension of the puberty blocker ban. It seems that the ban has been extended again through until the end of this year. This was done without fanfare or announcement. The only place that it appeared was on the website legislation.gov.uk and was shared from there to Reddit. 
And as someone pointed out there, a government ruling by constantly renewing what is supposed to be a temporary legislation that requires no additional parliamentary vote is maybe not a good precedent to set. I love democracy. I love the Republic. The power you give me, I will lay down when this crisis has abated. I was not surprised that they had extended it. I was, I guess, a little bit surprised that they were so... How could I put this um, neutrally? Slimy about it? I don't know. No, that's mm -hmm. not the right word. Um, they were sly. Sly is the word. Um, because they... I believe this change happened just as the US election was... Um, the big news. Yes. Mm. There wasn't any kind of large statements that I could see. You had to search for that and find it out, basically. Um, and then it was up to the community to spread that news and go, "Whoa, they've done this." So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised because so far they've really been trying to bang the drum and say we're doing the right thing. Blah, 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 blah. This doesn't look like that. This looks like, oh, we know we're doing the wrong thing, but we're gonna keep doing it. When I saw the puberty blocker, blocker ban being uh, extended after the sh depression I was feeling after the election, I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, not another shitty thing to come up. Yeah. 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 Also, there's isn't the extension. The the extend even cast didn't call for a, a, a indefinite extension or even a no. ban, or even no. a ban, and it's been pushed further and further. I mean, it's just you know the way you give an inch takes a mile, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it is. So, yeah, fuckers. Um, yep. Yep. <laughs> letting us die by inches. <laughs> but yeah, it's another shitty thing from another shitty person like Wes Streeting. But speaking of shitty people, uh, we all <laughs> naively hoped that we'd never have to talk about her again. But it's time for Calamitous Kemi to take the stage again. Oh. Hmm. Because Kemi Badenoch has been elected to lead the Conservative Party. She won the internal election on November 2nd, saying after she was chosen for the role, we have to be honest. Honest about the fact we made mistakes. Honest about the fact that we let standards slip. Did you really, Kemi? Good heavens, we barely noticed. This does make her the first black leader of a Westminster party, but it's just a shame it had to be her. Keir Starmer issued a pro forma congratulations to Badenoch, saying, I look forward to working with it in your party in the interests of the British people. Which suggests to us he is not being paying attention to given how often Badenoch has demonstrated she just doesn't care about the interests of the British people. Like when she suggested during the leadership contest that maternity pay is excessive. But other Labour members went on the offensive with Chairman Ellie Reeve saying that the Conservatives have learned nothing since the British people resoundedly rejected them in July. Kimmy Badenoch's election as leader shows they're incapable of change. Of all the people, <laughs> <laughs> the, they had two choices, right? They could either say, right, campaigning on this culture war bullshit lost us the last election mm. and we have to do an about face and get away from doing that. Or we lean more into it yeah, and, you know get themselves a Trumpian vibe and we'll come back to him in a minute. That's kind of how I, I feel like she's pulling a... I really do feel like she's pulling a Boris Johnson here. I think she's doing mm. exactly what he's doing. Make yourself loud and make yourself almost unreasonably conservative in a way for most people. Um, but it doesn't matter how many people initially balk at what you're saying. The fact is you're putting those conversations on the table and you're saying to those few who would want to take away you know maternity pay those who would want to lessen the rights of so many people that you are willing to do that that you are willing to go that far and i think that's entirely what she's doing she is signposting more than she is trying to make actionable claims it's concerning because she is going to be making those connections um even if it seems like she is putting herself further and further into a 
untenable territory. I don't think that's the case. I think she is just pushing further and further right. Mm. She's she's moving that Overton window um, further to the right for the Tory party, as if it could be any fucking further. But anyway. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> but I was just looking at election thinking, regardless of the outcome, it was a pick between a piss-filled soup or a shit-filled sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of people winning elections that they shouldn't have. Uh, yep. Hell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I I have a feeling that the the horse at our lovely sister podcast, the USA, uh, what the trans will have covered this wonderfully. They have very much have. And if you want to check out a full debrief of all that, then go there. But fuck that guy, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> fuck, him. fuck that guy. So yeah, Don't that's exactly him. what I was going. Um, well, <laughs> not lit- not that way, no. But as in, screw, screw that guy. Um, just disregard him. <laughs> Obviously, do check out the sister podcast, What the Trans USA, which covered a lot of um, slightly difficult territory this yeah. week. Yeah, they really did. So, just really quickly, there's a couple of things that the trans literature preservation project has suggested that internationally based trans people do and one of the things is to ensure and establish secure communication with your american friends so you know not something that's owned by facebook for example so something like proton or signal or telegram yeah we're we're not saying emotionally secure we're saying like encryption secure just just to be clear yeah definitely (laughs) you can also make your encrypted secure also emotionally secure but that's up to you yeah i mean hopefully (laughs) any friends that you have american or not your connection with them is emotionally secure but um aside from that make sure that you're encrypted as well definitely i think signal is is a good one for that and it also suggests there's a selection of things that this article um points out i will obviously put a copy of that article in our link in the description it's it's a long one it's like twenty four thousand words so it's a chunky one but there are like towards the end there's a list of things we can do and part of that is campaign and ensure fascism doesn't rise in other countries as well yeah let's do that <laughs> we're trying <laughs> we're definitely trying we will uh, do our best we're gonna keep trying oh we could certainly try, try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah right. yeah that also there was a really great article that i read about it and the article was just titled well shit, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, maybe we should link to that <laughs> i think that's gonna yeah, be good we idea. definitely will we definitely will Our next story is uh, an update on one that we have already covered. Just to say, there is a content warning. We are going to be discussing the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre. So if stories relating to anything like that might be difficult for you, then feel free to skip this one. Just heads up. And if you are skipping, skip to 30 minutes and 46 seconds. We last spoke about the centre in episode 114. A former employee named Roz Adams, who was dismissed by the centre for her gender-critical views, has unfortunately won a nearly £69,000 settlement from a tribunal. Former chief exec of ERCC, Riddle Wadha, who is herself trans, had apparently formed the view that Adams was transphobic, which led to a completely spurious and mishandled disciplinary process. That's a quote, that's not my opinion. As well as the payment to Adams, the ERCC also has to publish an apology on its website and start referring sexual assault survivors to Biera's Place, which is a support centre for female victims of sexual violence which was set up by none other than J.K. Rowling. Biera's Place is also where Adams now works. I wonder what their equalities procedures look like. In a statement, Adams said, My priority remains that all victim survivors of sexual violence can make a genuinely informed choice about the service they seek and have confidence in who will support them. To restore that confidence, I urge these organisations to give a clear definition of woman. And oh, what's that? What's that I can hear in the distance? Is it, is it a dog whistle? Am I suddenly a border yeah. collie? What the fuck? Really high-pitched hmm. or something. Yeah, yeah no, I, I thought it was just a, a Tory screaming in the distance, but no, no, it's, it's definitely a dog whistle. No, it's definitely not my dog clicker. <laughs> <laughs> This is shit. This is horrible. I hate this. I, I really don't like I'm annoyed. Yeah, there's a lot of feelings there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's just like multiple punches here of, oh, I take you to Beer's place and oh, here, give her 69,000 grand like a fucking insult, honestly. Yeah, well, it was 68,000 and something. So I didn't, I didn't want to overcomplicate 
writing it by putting in a very specific high number. I just thought I'd round it up. Um, So, yeah, and just just that little bit right at the end, just to let you know whether where Adams is coming from, I urge these organizations to give a clear definition of woman. So what ERCC are going to kind of have to do is um, they've already published the apology on their website, but they'll have to say, and if you'd prefer to go to a center that doesn't help trans women, you can go to Beera's place. Which is horrifying. The fact that you have to say that like that, like you're doing something wrong by supporting trans people who have gone through sexual assault is so it's uh it's levels of angry that i i struggle to put into words that i think would be productive Mm, yeah because it's such a serious thing to go through it's such a serious thing to have to seek help for um and to then have all of this fuckery on top of that as if it's not enough as if it's not enough to already go through whatever you'll have gone through to need that help. It, mm, 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 mm. Making it overcomplicated and needlessly so as well. Like, well, onward. Yeah. Some begrudged anti-trans activists have also decided to sue the Care Quality Commission regarding approving the gender clinic Gender Plus, citing the usual crap like the experimental treatment spiel they keep blathering on about, and ring that bell, (coughs) waving the usual stuff about their shitty cast review, which didn't even call for a ban on puberty blockers. CQC said that they couldn't comment on the ongoing legal proceedings, and Gender Plus said the following. In line with NHSE policy, for a young person to be accepted into the hormone pathway at GPHC, they must first pass through a multidisciplinary team review. This includes an independent consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist, in addition to other mental health and paediatric specialists not directly involved in the formation of the individual's care plan. Successful CQC registration has meant that Gender Plus and GPHC offer a pathway to safe, effective healthcare for transgender young people people under 18 years of age in the UK, which is lined with the current NHSC policy and international best practice. This is at a time when access to this essential care on the NHS is extremely limited. Indeed, a recent FOI demonstrates that NHSC's Children and Young People's Gender Pathway saw only eight new patients for assessments between January 2023 and July 2024. In contrast, during the same period, Gender Plus saw 388 new young people. Like any other patient population, transgender young people deserve access to timely, compassionate, regulated healthcare. Without access to regulated services, those under 18 years of age and their families will be forced to seek out medically unsafe and unregulated means, accessing the healthcare they need. This would present a significant safeguarding risk. (sighs) So, they're just trying to shut down... Another healthcare provider. Yeah, Yeah, trying to shut down Gender Plus. Yeah. And this feels like a similar playbook to what happened with um, Gender GP. Mm. Um, you know, yeah, it's always which... a blooming anti-trans activist with their bloody lawsuits, just throwing money. It's just... Yes. <sighs> yeah, yeah, definitely. They're just trying to erase any way at all for trans people to even exist, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the thing, though. We We will still exist. Mm. Yeah. We just won't be visible we will just (laughs) we won't be capable of living a life in the same way that everyone else does um well i say everyone else everyone else that fits the power you know fits the demands of hegemonic power um and the the notion that like you get to the notion that this is gonna stop trans people existing is like i think for them it may be that simple but we know that what happens when we don't have these things set up, as they said, is people will still do it. They will just, you know, have to, like back in the old days, give up their entire life and potentially become a missing person case in order to be able to do so. Or other such things, have to access things unregulated, run away from home when, you know, HRT starts showing changes or things like that. Like, there's so many ways in which trans people will persist because we are still going to be born because people are still born and guess what fuckers we're just Mm. people but at the same time if we have no ability to 
access the basic shit we need to live, to be ourselves, then it is going to cause severe continual harm. It's only going to be those people who feel capable or who know someone who can help them that are going to be able to make any differences. And every time I see yet another attempt to shut down healthcare, it's just like, it's it's as if you think the healthcare is what makes us trans. And actually, yeah. we're trans before that. <laughs> Oddly enough, yes. I remember um, when this when gender plus was originally verified by the care quality commission i remember doing a story and i think uh, this is a bit of a tangent away from the story but i remember at one point saying oh it felt like people like gender plus the clinicians went away from gender identity clinics and um because they abandoned uh, trans people for money but i think I just want to clarify because this is a while back uh, and I remember hearing some stuff about that comment and I am just want to say I've spoken to some people now I just want to retract that sort of comment and apologise for that one as well because I remember saying that and causing some issues so just want to put that there but um, yeah I think it's very annoying that they're trying to shut down a vital service like Gender Plus. So yeah on to our next story which again involves lots of anti-trans uh, people, anti-trans actors. Um, because our brand spanking new equalities minister Annalise Dodds met with the gender critical group Sex Matters back on November 6th. The group, widely known to trans people as an anti-trans pressure group, gleefully posted on Twitter that the meeting had taken place. The tweet reads, Sex Matters had a positive and constructive meeting with Annalise Dodds. <laughs> she reiterated that the government will provide single-sex spaces for biological women. We said this requires the law recognise biological women as a group that needs protection. Now, according to Sex Matters, they promote clarity about sex in law, policy and language in order to protect everybody's rights, and that they believe that ideas and behaviours promoted in the name of gender ideology are misguided and harmful. But this year, what they are mostly famous for is for their advocacy director Helen Joyce being caught reading Harry Potter <laughs> pornographic oh, fanfiction on a train, oh, which God. apparently was for <laughs> research purposes, although for oh, what God. research has yet to be adequately explained. <laughs> I forgot about this. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So yeah, Sex Matters, that's these guys. Well, yeah, I mean, Sex Matters so much that you're reading it on the train, you fucking fool. But apparently we're the weirdos. It's always very frustrating when you see anti-trans activists meet with senior members of government and yes. I've been trying to speak to some orgs to see whether they've been meeting with government ministers as well in the same high level way, even if it's just like in a back room somewhere being quiet and off the record and I'm not mm. really... Uh, and so far, everyone's going, oh no, I don't see anything happening from anyone I've talked to, which is mm. not really great. Yeah, it's it's concerning. I feel like we're going to have to operate on the understanding that this government has chosen a side in something yes. that really shouldn't need a side taken because you're choosing between respecting humans' dignity and, you know, representing your constituents' right to a safe and comfortable life, or not that. So that's the mm. choice that's been made by this government, it would seem. Um, yes. And they keep making that choice every fucking time they meet with one of these hate groups. I mean, sorry, um, charities with questionable motives. I'd be interested to see if Annalise Dawes has, has met with any LGBTQ supportive groups. I don't want to say pro-trans because even some organisations that are supposed to be supporting us have gone suspiciously <laughs> quiet. Mm. Um, about trans people. Well, I know our messages if they want to reassure us. <laughs> I keep trying to find new cause of actions for different stories and such. And I was just chatting with some people um, yeah. in, in a trade union, union I'm in and in a trans network and such. And, you know, there's still a lot of people in the labor link side of things in unison. And um, if you are part of a trade union or joining one, you don't have to, is a bit more that you can do instead of just joining a trade union there's a whole bunch of lgbt committees you can join there's trans networks and with that if you could join one of those you can find a whole bunch of actions you can take in those to then push trade unions as well because that might provide some pressure god knows but it's a route you can take if you want to take some kind of action because the more you pressure the trade unions to um 
be more painful towards government, the um, more likely things can go well. And largely as LGBT or trans groups are, the more power they have in the union. There is power in a union, as the song says. So we've been covering a lot of um, difficult news. So how about a little bit of a jaunt into Loser's Corner, folks? Loser's Corner. Ooh, is it that time? It's that time! That's right, folks, it's time for your favourite segment dedicated to the ancient universal law of fuck around and find out. An annoyingly vocal transphobe in London has decided to start a campaign of bigoted harassment against a lesbian bar called She Soho in London, and the bar has put out a statement to correct the record. The loser in question, Jenny Watson, went crying to the Daily Mail that she had been thrown out for being gender critical, pompously claiming that someone recognised her from online and complained until she was ousted. However, speaking to Pink News, a spokesperson for She Soho had this to say. Recently, a group of individuals with trans-exclusionary beliefs who have never visited our venue have targeted us with misleading and hurtful comments. They have misgendered our staff and patrons, spread false information about our space, and left fake reviews on our social media platforms. This occurred following the lawful ejection of a well-known gender-critical feminist. Our security team followed standard protocol using reasonable force to remove the individual after multiple attempts to invite her outside for a private discussion. A police officer patrolling the area was informed of the situation and engaged with both parties. After reviewing the circumstances, the officer confirmed that the ejection was lawful and that the venue had acted fully within its rights. Our team consistently adheres to procedures designed to minimise harm in such situations, and the police affirmed that these procedures are appropriate in this instance. We have documented the police details for future reference. So, there we have it. A complete surprise to no one. Karen, (coughs) I mean Jenny, clearly went in with an intention and when the venue exercised its rights, she decided to weaponise what celebrity she has in the hopes of having them shut down or forcibly turn them into a turf bar. Removing the polish of comedy for a second, we need to really address the fact that this is on the face of it. Like, clearly a stitch up. Because if you didn't know this already, she owns her own venue where she sets her own anti-trans rules. So she could have just decided to drink anywhere. She could have gone in there, had a rough time, decided to leave and literally go to her own bar. But no, she didn't. (laughs) Instead, it's quite clearly to me, it looks like a pathetic attempt at PR boosting for her bigger bar and grifter career. She's made herself a nuisance at this place and then when getting the consequences of that, she's thrown her toys out the pram. Because bearing in mind, to be clear, like she's made comments and, and acted in a way that does infringe upon the workers' rights to work in a safe space free from abuse. So, you know, it's clearly obvious that they were acting within their rights here. This actually does remind me of that common parlance in punk and anti-fascist circles. You only need to allow one Nazi at your bar for it to become a Nazi bar. They will bring friends. And it's harder to kick out five Nazis than one. This bar did the right thing by protecting their staff from people with violent beliefs. I have a feeling, a personal hunch, that she is trying to kick up enough fuss to start a legal battle that regardless of winning will be able to be manipulated and will yet again be testing the metal of the Equality Act. Maybe with the hopes of having gender critical beliefs bolstered. But I personally see it as connected to the code of practice changes at the EHRC, which we will talk about in a moment. Until then... Show she Soho some love. If you have the funds, maybe get a drink there. Show them that the trans community sees them standing up for us because, yeah, good on them. And because also this feels way more calculated than they first want us to believe. So let's be calculated in our support. Yeah, so I, I wasn't aware. I, I came across the story, but I wasn't aware that Karen, sorry, Jenny, <laughs> owned her own venue as it is. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, not that that stops people. Like, if you own your own venue, that doesn't mean you're not allowed to go into other places. Obviously, you can still do that. But it's um, looks like it might be more of a publicity effort than anything else. It really does make me wonder whether this is something that breaches into... Anti-competitive practices. Exactly. Was, but yeah, like anti-competitive practices to um, like bad business practices in a in like a, a legally problematic sense. I, I have no idea. It's not an area of law I'm in anyway, Verston. I'm not a lawyer in any way. But uh... mm. <laughs> yeah, it, it has a 
company just tanked so bad in trying to do business that she's then resorting to stupid stunts. <laughs> maybe. Or maybe she's still just trying to drum up support for it and turn it into mm. the agree you know, the bar set up by this aggrieved woman. But it's it's not. She's she's was in the news cycle a while ago for some other anti trans shit. She'll end up in the news cycle again whenever the Daily Mail have a bit of paper that's blank enough. It's you know, she's a grifter. She's a grifter. Yeah. She's trying to get anyone anywhere to put a little bit of money into her pocket so that she can make our lives worse for it. Go fuck yourself, Karen. I mean, sorry, Jenny. And speaking of anti-trans people just not getting their way, we've got a quick story about those scene networks. Ooh. We've talked about them before, the sex equality and equity networks, which is the hip new way to say gender critical, <laughs> which was the new way of saying turf, which is the old way of saying anti-trans. We've covered it before in that we've seen these networks popping up in the civil service, in finance, various other industries. But the good news is that the scene network within the Metropolitan Police will not be recognised as a legitimate group. This is according to a Blue Sky post from Adi Eliza, who is a co-founder and liberation officer within the Feminist Greens, who wrote, Following a briefing from senior Met officers today, I can confirm that the anti-trans police scene network is not recognised as an official Met staff association, will not be granted official status within the Met, and does not represent the Met in any capacity. Please spread the word. So, you know, it took a while, but we finally got a couple of pieces of good news. And it's, it's a shame, again, that it had to be the police who actually took a stand against this lot. It's a bit like when the very worst person you know makes a good point about something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about this. Like, yeah. that's cool, buds. You've got a lot more work to do than just that. If you think that's going to make me trust you, then who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. Like, okay, nice effort. Now do... All of the other things. Yeah, do any of the things we've been begging from you. Um. Yeah, like disbanding. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But I thought that was good news. Like, yeah. you know, they're, they're not getting their own way everywhere. They're not in uh, She and Soho. Or they haven't in the Metropolitan Police. There are some people who know what they're about, who know that they're just anti-trans nasty wankers, mm. and they're not willing to stand for it. Mm. And that's great. Yeah. It's all great to see some positive news. And we've got some more positive news coming up. Hey. Mm. Most of the news we've been speaking about has just been depressing. But this one is something celebrating a pioneering transgender woman that drove an Ulster bus in the 1970s. This is set to be told in a new play at the Outburst Queer Arts Festival, telling the story of Will McCreef, who has done so many amazing things, like setting up a helpline, a support group for the trans community, and so much more. Belfast Lord Mayor Mickey Murray said that the play, Suspect Device, really reflects one of the core themes of our Belfast 2024 programme, our people, and the contributions individuals like Wilma have made to our city's development. She was way ahead of her time in her response to the hardships she faced, particularly living through a time of great social and political upheaval and her journey is inspirational to a community that continues to face struggles and challenges today. He said that I'm very much looking forward to learning more about Wilma's life and her personality from this fantastic production by, Kabuk, by Kabush. I think that's how you... Say it. I don't know. I, I assumed it was Kabosh. Kabosh. Well, yeah, this fantastic think it's production by Kabosh. <laughs> <laughs> With that way of saying it. But yeah, it's pretty cool, wasn't it? Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's it's really cool. I, l I love finding out more. It reminds me of like when we found out about um, Wendy Carlos on like a sort of bigger scale and everyone was like, Oh, fuck yeah. Wait, this person's actually been involved in several of my favourite films and things like that. And I just, I live for it. I mean, Wendy Carlos was cool. <laughs> yeah. Don't know why I'm using past tense. Wendy Carlos is still alive and she is cool. Oh, but... okay. <laughs> so this, this particular play, like, I wish I could have caught it really. Bit mm. tricky for me to get over to Belfast. This is really cool. And this does tie into something else that as well as the Action Alley segment, we are going to try and pick up on more bits of trans joy yeah because we need that right <laughs> right now like, more than ever yeah definitely and when i say we need that i mean yes the community needs that and we need to signal boost these uh 
bits of trans joys there come along. But when I say we need that, I mean we, us, the production team here at What the Trans, we need that. <laughs> <laughs> because we spend so long up to the elbows, you know, dipping into these often quite difficult stories. Mm. I think it can be easy to lose scope. Yes, We spend exactly. so much time having to um, research, fact check, look into some of the worst kinds of people. And mm. that it can make it really easy to then forget that just because you've spent a week full of rain that you, you may forget there's a rainbow that's going to be at the end of that. I think some of you may have noticed on our social medias that we've been posting asking for your stories of trans joy and I think we're going to keep trying to do that on the regular. Um, and there was some that we saw on Blue Sky for example, wasn't there, Flint? Yeah, there was. Saw Joanna on Blue Sky has finally booked her orchiectomy for January. Congratulations, Joanna. Nika has found out that their new GP is trans positive and is happy to get into private shared care agreements. And we have seen some people celebrating anniversaries for their surgeries and hormones like Lee Hurley, who has been celebrating his 10 year top surgery anniversary. And there is also um, a trans film about dance that we will link the trailer to in the description. I definitely want to watch this. Um, I cannot wait for it. Can I share my own little bit of trans joy? Ooh. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, November the 14th, the day that we are recording this, is my my deed poll anniversary. So the day I officially changed my name to Ashley was November the 14th, 2012, right? So it's been 12 years. That's really cool. I did a less smart thing. Um, I decided to have my deed poll day on my birthday, and then I kind of did myself out of an extra birthday for it. From well, now on, so I have... any trans milestones, they're not allowed to happen on my birthday. <laughs> Same thing. So I uh, I di- didn't think about my birthday and my rebirthday, which is what Lexi calls it. I call it my Ashleyversary. <laughs> but so my birthday proper is earlier on in November, and then mid-November the 14th is when I've uh, is is my Ashleyversary. Mm. Um, so I've kind of got two, but they're pretty close together. So I only ever getting one. I only <laughs> ever end up getting one present. Yeah. <laughs> so that's trans joy. Try and embrace it where you can. One last thing and then we'll get into the meat, okay? On Wednesday the 13th, we found out that the EHRC's chair, Fuck it up Faulkner, has had her term in office extended by one more year. This follows that the contract running for Faulkner's tenure was due to expire this month. Speculation was and still is rampant on who was going to take her place, especially given that it would be a definitive indicator of the direction of travel of the Labour government and see what direction they would want to take in terms of their treatment of trans people in law. In an exclusive to What the Trans, we have learned from a reliable source that Harriet Harman was offered the role of chair but suddenly decided to refuse it at the last minute. Now, this would align with Faulkner's temporarily extended term, which would allow Labour to find a new candidate, as Harmon had refused, of course. So, yes, that was a strange one to see coming in at the 11th hour, wasn't it? Yeah, I can, can we talk about the fact that it is kind of wild that um, l- the, the government had no one as a backup? Mm, mm. They, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't think about anyone else that could be doing this? They they truly went. Oh, she said no. Uh, 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 shit, shit. You again. You again. You again. No, mm. that's not how you should run a fucking government. What are you talking about? Like, ah, you need backup plans. Right. Truly. Like, like, how many times are we finding out now that very important people that are given the power to make decisions about thousands of people's lives in this country turn out to be the only ones selected and the only ones shortlisted for the job? Mm. Continually. Yeah. That's not on. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, I think that even if it's a, well, we just need to find someone that's good and, and you, you had to give her a, an extension, that's not good enough. That's not good mm. enough. That's not signaling to anyone that you are any different from the people that came before you. In fact, it Quite. signals that you are completely fine with continuing that absolute travesty just just to because you don't see it as important. You know, yeah, and you quite. need to and see this as important. Given all the criticism that Falconers come in, come in for, and all all of it justifiable. Yeah, and they've just decided, oh no, no, you can stay on. 
It's worth pointing out that there are some commissioners for the EHRC who are due to have their contracts ex expire within the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So we'll see if they get renewed again or if somebody else gets appointed to that and we'll, you know, we'll see what difference that makes, if that's any sort of indicator for the direction of travel. But uh, <laughs> I um, wouldn't say I'm optimistic. No, I'm not, because she's going to now have the ability to extend those contracts of some of those commissioners that we know are not acting with our interests in mind. Um, and, you know, that's going to make it then harder for the person that does get the next job to, um, I, well, I, I believe, uh, to to ensure that the change of direction that you know, we would want to see from the HRC happens if they decide to pick someone who actually wants that. Um, mm. You know, I I do wonder why Harmon refused. My my only, I, I don't know um, much about Harriet Harmon, but I could understand if maybe seeing the way that Labour have been patchy on human rights, mm. she might not have wanted to have taken on that role and been the figurehead of that institution if she knew that, you know, some of the things that Labour have been discussing, well, that our government have been discussing, are, I would say, problematic for human rights, certain policies, um, not just trans ones, but like, because like even the, the trans, uh, e even transphobia aside, um, which it shouldn't be, but um, <laughs> the, the bullying should be enough alone. Yeah, when I was speaking to the people who gave me the info, I, there was some ideas on what it might have been, but... I'm not sure how much I can say without exposing them, unfortunately. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Um, but there is, there, there are reasons I'm concerned that I can't really... Um, can't really articulate at this time. Well, sticking with the EHRC, let's go to the delicious main course for our episode. Meat! 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 So couple of episodes ago we've mentioned that the EHRC has put out a draft code of practice and how they have launched a consultation about it. Uh, so this week we spoke to Sarah Clark from Trans Safety Network who's done some analysis on this and spoke to us about their thoughts and findings. If you take it away, us in the past. Well, hmm. I'm with um, Sarah Clark, um, she here from Trans Safety Network. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. So you've done some brilliant work with doing some analysis on um, the EHRC's recent consultation on the code of practices for services, public functions and associations. And for some of our audience who may not be familiar, would you be able to explain to us what the code of practice is? So the code of practice is a document that the EHRC put out. So the EHRC are sort of the UK state body that are responsible for uh, enforcing and promoting equality law and the the code of practice is specifically in relation to the equality act and to the obligations that organizations have under the equality act uh, in terms of providing public services and things like that of course with what the EHRC have done with the Code of Practice recently. What are your thoughts on the guidance they've updated recently? A lot of the function of the Code of Practice is that primarily it is supposed to exist to inform organisations, you know, whether that's a company, whether that's charities, whether that's public sector organisations like the NHS or schools, um, on on what exactly what their obligations are. And because of that, what it also kind of does is gives us sort of a flavour of what the EHRC's priorities are, what what we noticed analysing it. Um, and and the yeah, Trans Safety Network, obviously, our remit is primarily concerned with changes that are going to affect uh, trans people as a group. So we were looking at the changes that were made to the code of practice with respect to gender reassignment. That's the, the protected characteristic under the Equality Act that trans people have. And so, so, so what we noticed was that there's, there's, there's been a real sort of shift in emphasis in, in how the, this, this draft code of practice that they put up for consultation talks about, um, about gender reassignment. 
uh, the sort of this the, the the current version of the code of practice, which was published in twenty eleven, quite strongly focuses on the importance of trans people's rights being upheld. So the the, uh, the like the current version includes some language that says things like that. Um, like a, a quote here. Um, the intention is to ensure that the transsexual person is treated in a way that best meets their needs. Going on to say that the, the, de um, the denial of a service to a transsexual person should only occur in exceptional circumstances. What that means is that because, because the legal position, um, the way that the Equality Act has generally been interpreted and the way that the case law means is that the default position should be trans inclusion that trans people should be able to use gendered spaces and services in the gender that they present as is is the the phrasing that's usually used that that sort of baseline statement of what the default position is is still in the code but what has gone is the very clear statement that when you're applying exceptions to this, and there are exceptions under the Equality Act, which have always been used, like particularly they've, they've often been used um, in the violence against women and girls sector with varying degrees of appropriateness, in my opinion. Um, so, so, so by removing that language that sort of emphasises the importance of applying um, exceptions to uh, trans people's rights under the Equality Act as restrictively as possible. That's another phrase that has gone um, with respect to, uh, to gender reassignments uh, in the draft code of practice. By removing that, they are kind of signalling that they are treating trans people's rights as less of a priority. And you know, TSN, we're, we're quite concerned by that because the EHRC, in theory, is supposed to be the body that enforces gender reassignment protections alongside protections for other protected characteristics. What well, One thing that we've noticed uh, particularly is that so the code of practice uh, comes with a lot of examples of how it should be applied. And those examples are just kind of like you, you'll have sort of a statement of a definition of a type of discrimination, like direct discrimination. And then you'll have a few examples of sort of real world scenarios where that type of discrimination might take place uh, with a few, usually with the, usually there'll be a few examples covering a few different protected characteristics. So you might have an example of direct sexual orientation discrimination, an example of direct race discrimination, and an example of uh, say direct gender reassignment discrimination. There were, I think we, we counted in, in the current code of practice, there are, there are seven of those examples that explicitly lay out examples of unlawful discrimination against trans people. All but one of those has either been completely removed from the code of practice in the draft version, or it's been really quite significantly altered. So, so, so what you'll see is... Um, for instance, in a part of the code of practice that talks about discrimination uh, in general, one of the examples is of a trans man who's applying for a license to open a nightclub, and the you know, the, the council, the the licensing authority, are putting unnecessary and onerous restrictions on his license that they aren't placing on people from who aren't trans. Um, so, so that can be an example of discrimination by a public body, by a government body, and that that has just been completely removed. I mean, it it still would be unlawful for a council to do that, but the fact that examples like that are just gone, we 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 think that's quite concerning, and particularly uh, like the examples uh, with respect to things like uh, single sex spaces where they've had examples outlining that it is good practice to, for example, allow a trans woman to use the appropriate uh, changing facilities at a clothes shop. Right. Yeah, that's, that's gone. What we saw in a couple of cases was that an example would be retained, but they would reword that example 
from talking about trans people to talking about gay or lesbian people. Um, Literal erasure. yeah, and it's it's kind of this thing of obviously we don't want any queer people to be discriminated against under any circumstances. But in light of all the other removals and this sort of shift of emphasis that we've seen, you know, it's uh, we, we we think it's pretty telling that those changes have been made. Um, and Mm. it, it feels like for all that the EHRC makes a big song and dance about how sexual ori sexual orientation and gender reassignment are separate categories and they're completely different. It does seem like they 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 kind of see us as interchangeable when it suits them. I think as well, another thing you mentioned in your um, analysis was in chapter eight, you mentioned EHRC removed an example of someone misgendering a trans woman. It sounds a bit like they're trying to appease Maya Forstater, doesn't it? I, I mean, I, obviously, I couldn't say whether they're, they're specifically trying to appeal to Maya Forstater. Um, but there, there's, there's definitely, I think, an element of, of that kind of... To, to be perfectly honest, it kind of seems like them sort of throwing red meat to the to the sort of gender critical crowd. I mean, they they do reference the uh, the famous um, four state uh, legal case, which was uh, four state uh, the CGD Euro, which is the case where Maya four state took her former employers to court, um, claiming that they'd discriminated against her on the basis of religion and belief, and You know, after a lot of legal back and forth, it was found that uh, four status beliefs did meet uh, the the Granger criteria, which is sort of the the bare minimum criteria for being sort of respectable enough to be entitled to protection under the Equality Act. It's where we get this phrase uh, "worthy of respect in a democratic society." You get sort of GCs putting this on T-shirts, practically. dancing in the street shouting it and effectively the legal meaning of it is you're not quite as bad as an actual nazi <laughs> and like that is that that is the real legal meaning of that you could argue back and forth about whether that was whether that was an appropriate decision by the court but that that is part of the case law and the code of practice is supposed to reflect the law and the case law So it is appropriate that they they cite that case because it was quite a big case. But Mm. they they cite that in their section on religion or belief. They also cite uh, the the Macareth case, which was a a similar case which went against the person being transphobic, because the the way that Macareth wanted to manifest his beliefs would have been contrary to the dignity of trans people, because. What Macareth fundamentally objected to was the idea that in a professional setting, he was not allowed to directly misgender trans people. So so both those cases are mentioned uh, in passing and in terms of explaining the Granger criteria. Um, but what what is interesting with that section is that there's, there's like a list of examples of manifestations of uh, religion or belief. And most of the, you know, this this list was is in the current uh, code of practice, with with one exception. And mo most of the items in the list are fairly, I would say, are fairly neutral. You know, wearing particular clothing or avoiding or carrying out particular activities. They're very they're very broadly worded. And then in the in the draft code of practice, sort of slapped in the middle of that is expressing gender critical views online. Yeah. Oh. That seems odd to me, because because no, nothing else in that list is that specific, and yeah, you know, there are plenty of sort of beliefs that you you could maybe say straddle the border between philosophical belief and political belief that have been found to be uh, to meet the Granger criteria in court. So you know, be belief in um, in climate change uh, was the the original test case that the Granger criteria came from. Scottish nationalism has been found to to meet the Granger criteria and to meet the criteria for being a protected belief. Mm. Ethical veganism has, um, you know, quite quite a famous case that's been in the papers recently. You know, anti-Zionism has. It doesn't say expressing ethical vegan uh, views online. It doesn't say expressing Scottish nationalist views online. You know, it yeah, doesn't it's... say what. seems like it would be appropriate to me which is just 
expressing the belief online it specifically singles out gender critical views um and yeah I, I think in terms of sort of insofar as you could say they're trying to appeal to Maya Forstey so I, I I think that's one place where where they sort of are doing that and you know there's there's been with uh with Kishwa Falconer uh who's the chair of the EHRC there's been a lot of good old fuck it up oh, Falconer yeah yeah, there's, there's been, shall we say, that there's been some concerns about her relationship to the gender critical movements. Um, oh, God, I've been screaming to the rooftops, I suppose, as well. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's not been subtle, has it, really? So, so, yeah, I think that there is an element of that there, and there is an element, you know, I, I, I suspect, no, you know, sort of, in my opinion, that perhaps um, Falconer's very strong sympathies towards the gender critical movement have had an influence on this new draft guidance um, no, definitely i think when i spoke to someone else they mentioned it felt like when they were reading through it that parts of the guidance regarding trans people was instead of framed on how to um be inclusive towards trans people it's framed as a guide as how business can discriminate against trans people what would be your thoughts on that one no, I mean, I, th I think that's that's very much there. Quite a lot of the material that talks about gender reassignment seems to be very strongly focused on giving organisations examples of when it is lawful to discriminate against trans people and not very much on how they can avoid unlawfully discriminating against us, which, you know, if, if the EHRC were a body that was concerned with people's human rights, you'd think would be... Uh, would be much more of a focus. The stuff in in the draft code of practice about cross dressing, so called, um, because the the context in which it's used is with reference to trans people and the appropriateness of that sort of terminology. Mm. Yeah, you know, the a, a lot of people are going to have different opinions on that. But you know, if if we mean wearing clothes that aren't stereotypically associated with your assigned gender. You know, which is I think is sort of the the usage that's implied. Well, one sort of shift has been there is much more focus in that part on when it is lawful to bar somebody from a space for cross dressing, which es essentially comes down to is this person trans? I mean, it, it it may well be lawful to have a rule that says you can only wear a dress while being assigned male at birth if you are trans. That may be lawful. I would strongly disagree with, um, <laughs> with with any organization having a policy like that. I don't think that organizations should be trying to police people's gender presentation. But beyond that, um, for the EHRC to put so much focus on almost giving organizations an out when we refuse this trans person entrance, we, we mistakenly believe that they were a cis cross-dresser. So actually, you know, this, this is a sort of mitigating factor. And I, I, I don't know if that would that would ever stand up, but it it seems to be encouraging that sort of behaviour and encouraging organisations to 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 go around policing um, people's sort of gendered clothing, and I, I think that's that's harmful to trans people. I think it's it's harmful to to quite a lot of of other queer people, um, you know, in sort of mm. queerness and gender nonconformity, whether you're trans or not. I've always sort of been very closely associated with each other. They they talk quite briefly in the draft uh, code of practice about uh, non-binary and gender fluid people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we were curious to see what your thoughts are, and if you could walk us through what was included there. Yeah, so so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a strange beast that little sort of couple of paragraphs because in in some ways there's an element of a positive development there, which is that. The current version of the code of practice does not acknowledge the existence of non-binary or gender fluid people in any meaningful way. It generally says transsexual because that is that is the the language in the Equality Act, and the the uh, the draft code of practice actually moves away from doing that and justifies it somewhat. Basically, effectively saying where we say trans people here, we mean transsexuals under the Equality Act. The the language okay. in the current code of practice is. It, it will either just say transsexuals or or it will say a transsexual man or a transsexual woman. 
um, there's no real acknowledgement of the fact that there are a lot of trans people who would not consider themselves to be men or women. Mm. Um, and they they are protected um, under the under the Equality Act. They, and the, there is case law to back that up. And I think that the fact that there has been case law that's emerged since the current version of the Code of Practice was published is probably why that acknowledgement is in there at all. Um, there's, there was a, a case, uh, it was a tale of the Jaguar Land Rover, which was uh, where a, a gender-fluid trans person, um, uh, Rose Taylor, who worked for, for Jaguar Land Rover, ba basically was, was discriminated against and treated pretty shoddily by, uh, by JLR. So she, she took them to court. Part of this court case was that JLR tried to argue in court that the, the gender reassignment protections of the Equality Act did not apply to a gender fluid person. The, the, uh, the tribunal uh, basically found that was wrong and, and sort of pointed to the, the lack of any really sort of binary language in the Equality Act and the fact that Per the language of the Equality Act, gender reassignment is not necessarily um, a medical process. You know, it talks about physiological and other aspects of sex. So it's it's talking about social transition as well, and pointed to dis you know discussions that were happening around the writing of the legislation and about the fact that fluidity of gender and the existence of a sort of spectrum was part of that conversation. I think listeners of your show and we know that. The concept of non-binary people and gender fluid people didn't pop into existence after the Equality Act was passed. You know, it's mm. that's been around for a long time, yeah. um, and that was part of the conversation when the legislation was passed. And so, yes, the the court found that yes, a you know a gender fluid person or a non-binary person could be considered to be going through a process of reassigning their sex because they're moving away from their assigned of birth gender. So really, the EHRC sort of had to to had acknowledge to this, um, but the the way in which they have done that is to say that uh, non-binary and gender fluid people are only protected if they are undergoing a process of reassigning their sex, which it then doesn't doesn't really explain. cover it. Yeah, it, it doesn't really because because if if reassigning your sex legally. Uh, in terms of the Equality Act, can include things like changing your pronouns or changing your name or changing how you dress. I, I would struggle to think of any non-binary person or any gender fluid person that I know or that mm. anybody I've spoke to knows that wouldn't come under that to some degree. I mean, if we're talking about the social aspects of, of gender sex, you know, you the the act of saying actually I am not male or actually I am not female, I am something else, is a, an act of social transition. It is mm. you know, that, that sort of coming out as being trans in some way. It, it, it very heavily implies that a significant portion or maybe even most non-binary or gender fluid people wouldn't be covered by those protections and that's just... It's not great Yeah, at all. that's not the case at all. And the, the example that it uses is of somebody who is transitioning and is referring to themselves as gender fluid insofar as they will present differently on different days, which make, makes me think, to be honest, that the person who was reading this possibly didn't really know what gender fluid meant. <laughs> um, Won't surprise me for EHRC in general, really. But yeah, it kind of like, so getting back to the, the original points of that, it, it seems like they're, they're, they're acknowledging this ruling and this this recognition that non-binary and gender fluid people at least can be entitled to those legal protections, but only in the context of saying, but not necessarily. It sounds like there's a, a lot of notes on what needs to be uh, improved and you've done some brilliant work in your, um, your analysis. Thank God it's been so helpful for us. As we've seen with multiple consultations uh, a lot of it people haven't felt like they've been listened to like for example the nhs puberty blocker ban and we've seen how institutionally captured the ehrc has been what are your thoughts on whether people should fill it in i think that's a complicated question i mean tr trans safety network 
as a trans community organisation, will be responding to the consultation as an organisation. We're planning to do that. Um, and quite a lot of what we will say in our consultation response is is reflected in what was in the article that we put out and some of the things that I've said um, today. I, I, I would encourage any person who wants to to try to sort of have it, yeah, you know, to have some input to to fill that consultation out. But at the same time, I think you are right that a lot of the time with with these public consultations, they're they're a bit of a box ticking exercise. Really, they're done so that they can be said to have been done, rather than to actually get any real input. Mm. And I think quite a lot of us have become quite jaded <laughs> about these consultations. Because, I mean, I don't know, like the, the amount of time and effort that I and a lot of other people put into to responding to the various Gender Recognition Act consultations and holding public events, explaining to people how they can respond, you know, showing people how to use the website to respond, you know, people producing sort of model responses and, and websites for, for people to respond as easily as possible for, for those consultations where they actually released the data so the majority of responses were strongly in favor and that basically amounted to, to nothing what, what i would say is that if you want to respond to the consultation you can do so and and we will be responding as an organization where, where, whether i'd sort of say as a as a strategy, as a community, we should be really pushing, responding to these consultations. I, I'm not so sure about that. One thing I would say, I, I, I try to make a point of this, because I think sometimes, especially a lot of stuff coming out of Trans Safety Network, um, it, can, it can be a bit doom and gloom, and it can be, you know, this, this, this terrible thing is happening, and this terrible thing, and this terrible thing. And I think that gets quite tiring for people, understandably. I wouldn't want people to feel sort of completely hopeless here. One thing I would say is that there are some ways in which uh, the draft code of practice is an improvement on the current version. The, the draft version does acknowledge that, that trans men can have the, the protected characteristic of pregnancy and maternity. Um, and I think that making organisations aware of that, whether or not your your policy says pregnant woman, you still cannot discriminate against a pregnant trans man i think making mm. that point clear to organizations is is important and the some of the language around the rights of trans children uh, in the draft code of practice has actually been strengthened compared to compared to the current version you know the um, the draft version of the code of practice uh, plainly states that there is no minimum age for the protected characteristic of gender reassignment and i think that's that's vital because we have seen state bodies trying to claim otherwise, trying to claim that that trans youth are not really trans and therefore do not have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment. It, that's wrong legally. The Good Law Project uh, took the NHS to course over some issues with trans youth healthcare. And Unfortunately, they did. They lost. They did lose the overall case, um, and I don't think any of us were happy about that. But one, one good thing that came out of that was that the court quite explicitly ruled that yes, trans youth can have that protected characteristic. They are entitled to not be discriminated against, or victimized, or treated unfairly because they are trans, because they have that protected characteristic of gender reassignments. You know, the, the Department for Education has, has tried similar stuff. Uh, you know, the um, the draft uh, RSE guidance that the uh, the Tories put out not long before they left office made that claim. Um, and you know, the, the the current version of the statutory guidance on safeguarding for schools, keeping children safe in education, uh, has replaced references to trans children with references to gender questioning children. So I, I think having that that clear official recognition from a statutory body that trans kids exist, they exist as people, they exist mm. in law, and they have legal rights as as trans people, 
um, you know, I, I think that that's a positive development, and I think that that's something that, I mean, whether it remains in in the new version of the code of practice when it comes out or not, that is still legally the case. Um, but I think having that there and being able to clearly point to that, no, you are you are wrong about this. Um, I think is is quite important. So so there are there there are some sort of there there is some good news amongst all the issues with it. So some good points raised there, I think. Yeah. Where they've said there have been some concerns about Faulkner's relationship with the gender critical movement. Very diplomatically put there, Sarah, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the way that she explained um the nuances of the framing um and how mm. small things such as just taking away a, a, an example that includes a trans person can have a massive impact on how that document is used um and how that document is understood having someone be able to walk us through the minutia of that really helpful and really good thank you ever so much sarah um yes i do feel this is why i want to tie it back to the loser's corner story because I feel like this might be the next push. I feel like we might see more situations like the bar one. Like, don't get me wrong. I do think that I do personally think that she is doing it for um, her own gain. Um, mm. But I also think that it is kind of Occam's razor to think that she is a notable transform with notable transform connections, that this is something that has been slowly, that we have slowly seen become more and more the topic of conversation codes of practice and how to treat people in um like public spaces like shops and whatnot mm. i do feel like we might see this as the next turn they, they they had a good run of focusing primarily on um school age things and you know education and things like that and i'm wondering if now they're going for the adults in places that are sort of public where there is these codes of practices and whatnot no i've wondered that myself to be perfectly honest and I know we were all hoping that Faulkner was going to leave before the consultation ended. Yeah. And so that, like, a different, perhaps maybe even more progressive candidate could take over. But mm. uh, that's not happened. She's burrowed in like a little tick and she's hanging on for another year. Yeah. So that's that's not good. So once again, thanks to Sarah Clark from Trans Safety Network for sitting down with Alex. Trans Safety Network are pretty awesome. Everything they do is worth reading, frankly. Truly. If you're not following them on social media or looking at their website, I recommend that you... That's exactly what you should do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And we've also made a start back on our Blue Sky where they're added as well. We so have. Yeah. Found as well. We have indeed. Like, one one final thing. Um, Sarah is really right when she brings up the, the aspect about not feeling too much doom and gloom. Um, there are some less negative aspects to this guidance, like she mentioned with non-binary... Um, inclusion things like that um mm. but i i i do also understand obviously the hesitation and it's just how this is going to be used but this is why we have the trans joy section this is why we are doing a lot to make sure we're showing the full scope right not just the bad that's mm -hmm. very important but the good that is vitally important for the soul if nothing else um, yes mm. absolutely and just one last thing on the EHRC and the consultation. The consultation will be open until 5pm on January the 3rd. Yes. So plenty of time to fill it in. I think that's more or less it. I think it? that's it. Yeah, we might yeah. have done it. Let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Well done, everyone. We got through this, including the audience. Well done, you. <laughs> well done, team. Thanks for listening. Yes, absolutely. And you can ch you can check us out on whatthetrans.com. All of our stuff goes there. We've pivoted away from Twitter. We're kind of not really using that anymore because there's been a mass exodus over to huh. Blue Sky. Because I've seen... Oh, Blue Sky! <laughs> and we've... We've been on Blue Sky for a little while, so we're whatthetrans.bsky.social. Obviously, you can find us on Facebook, and if you're able to, either share or try and support us on our Patreon. We are at 95 supporters. We don't have that many to go before we get to 100, and Ooh. for some reason I've set that in my head as a nice milestone. If anyone wants to be part of that final five, ooh! Uh, should, we, should we offer some kind of extra special prize or something? Um... Stickers, t-shirts, I don't know. We'll we'll do some merch. Yeah, we'll uh, figure out a little, <laughs> it's a little surprise. 
Yeah. Whether you get something or not, we'll find out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ominous looming with the threatening yes. of gifts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye, everyone. And we'll speak to you in a couple of weeks. Bye. 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 This episode of What the Trans was written, produced and presented by Alex, Ashley and Flint and was edited by Amber Devereaux, Ollie Morris and Lowry and with music composed by Waritsara Yui Kahlberg. We would especially like to thank our producer-level Patreons who are Alison Cole, Eris, Tin Roof, Naistrom, Danny Gold, Lex Phoenix, Sebastian Singh Soprano, Joe the Low Quality MB, Andrea Brooks Jack Edwards Dulcie Stefan Blakemore Noat Needles and Freds Flaming Daphne Dr. McGee Jen Rachel Harris Katie Reynolds Georgia Holden Burnett Grabalicious Mux Afon Roots Minus One Gray Elizabeth Anderson Bernice Roust Ellen Mello Jay Hoskins Rowan Ashley Matty B Set Cab Jane Roberto De Prunk Rose Absolute Sarah Cena Kiki T D Sky Killane Eric Whitman B Jude Monsieur Squirrel I love that name Fergus Evans Anubisa Jackal Kamina Brandon Craig Break the System Sean Phillips Heidi Reardon Ezra Lentil Clara Volumey Amelia Samantha Raven Ravenheart Bringer of the Heavy Metal Tabitha Joe Cox aka Candy Fiona McDonald Murgatroyd Ontologically Unjust Stella Cinder Goza Rebecca Prentice Crazy Richard! Dan Oblivion. Florence Stanley. Helen. L. Hollingsworth. Nick Ross. Melody Nix. Fiona Punchard. John. Mysterious Anonymous Patron. C.B. Bailey. Gordon Cameron. Ted Delphos. Kai Lewin. Vic Parsons. Patreon user Vic Kelly Catherine Sabrina McVeigh Cassius Adair Melissa Brooks Kraken 12 April Heller Sophie Lewis Alexandra Lilly Claire Scott Ariadne Pena Lauren Onias <laughs> Bernard's Pink Jelly Bean Lenos and Chris Hubley Thank you for all for watching Cheers folks <laughs> Bye, bye, bye. Watching? <laughs> Thank you all for listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shit, fuck. What medium do we even make? Who knows anymore? <laughs> <laughs>